everyone, and welcome to the second session of the Dairy Technology Tuesday webinar series hosted by Cornell Cooperative Extension Statewide Dairy Specialists and Cornell Pro Dairy. My name is Camila Laje, and I work as a dairy management specialist for the CCE Southwest New York team. Before we start, I would like to thank you, our sponsors, who we were seeing on the slides leading up to the presentation. With their generous support, we are able to bring this program to you at no cost. So thank you to them. Uh, recordings to this presentation will be available on February 28th on the ProDairy page and our YouTube channels. If you want to view, rewatch, or share, that's where we will go to get those. I would also want to remind all of you that we are going to have a Q&A session in the end. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them on the Q&A box and we are going to make sure to answer them in the end. So with that, I would like to introduce our speaker for the session. Dr. João Costa will be presenting about technology for housing and managed dairy calves. João is an assistant professor of dairy science at the University of Kentucky, and his research program is focused on precision dairy farming, dairy cattle nutrition, management, and welfare. João, uh, can you share your screen, please? Yeah, I can see your screen. So if you are ready, please take it over. So, Dr. Laji, thank you so much for having me here again to talk a little bit about some of the uh, precision technology for dairy calves and how to use, and especially some of the some topics of using the data to manage these animals that are becoming more and more important in the industry. So, I will try in this whatever thirty to forty-five minutes discuss a little bit of the options that we have, uh, some of the, the challenges especially, but especially some of the examples that we have where the technology can be integrated in how we manage and especially how we, we raise these animals in an in intensive modern uh, farming systems. So even before anything like the precision technology world is a world that is growing exponentially all the time like every day even working with that every day we see something new something that is going on and i like to promote especially the 4d 4f initiative that is an initiative from europe that have in their website a very good link of option right here we will not go through the options that we have of precision dairy technology precision livestock farming because it's growing crazily but in their website uh, the network of scientists put a very uh, extensive list of the options that are there for research and especially for commercial application and and they have a link to some of the validation that were done. This is our like at the bottom also our website like our social media that have uh, a lot of this information as well. But precision dairy farming is growing crazily, right? Here is a, an example of uh, a myriad of these options that we have obviously more and more on the farms we see the colors the pedometers uh, the electronic ear tags but with the imaging with some of the internal wear device like the rumen bolus uh, those options are growing commercially and if we go to the research side and i will present some of that with the microchipping uh, with some of the more in-depth imaging that algorithms that are coming out uh, we are getting this very broad picture of continuous monitoring of each of these animals that that are on our farms the options are pretty much limited right if we think on sensors that we have even to uh, available to the humans right now to the human precision uh, monitoring we can see that that field will just grow and especially here we'll talk about uh, the calf side and a few years ago when we are starting to do a lot of well we, we still do a lot of development and validation of this technology we start to discuss what would be the next step uh, for the precision technology on farm especially on dairy farms and if we think about how the farmers are already have that relationship with data where we have so much data uh, being created and so little of that 
being used on farm, we start to discuss that the next step should not be to provide or to produce more data to, to these stakeholders that were already with little time to deal with, but to make sure that some of this technology actually would help the management of these animals doing things automatically. And with that, that thought or that approach, we start to change what we did as research and I will show uh, some of that, right? That obviously uh, the technology has to be translated into something. Uh, we, we keep talking about the technology of uh, the pub, right? Of the bar. It's really nice to have a technology that, that is very interesting data that is really nice like and you know any person can do whatever they want with their money or their investment but an investment in technology if you think as a business that is the dairy farm should provide an action and that action should be uh, profitable to the enterprise obviously the information has to be there then the technology has to be robust and reliable if not doesn't resist our system but in the end of the day, without that data as a, uh, would create more problem than actually uh, be a solution and that technology should respond automatically. And that's what I will show today, some examples, but I think that approach, it's what is, is changing uh, slowly, right? And what I will go through my whole talk is like, we need to find out which cow we need. And especially when we talk about calves and heifers, that is fundamental, right? Like, is that like the, <laughs> this cow just won uh, the Royal Fair in Toronto the other day. Is that the cow that we need on farm? That's the cow that we need to raise. And that really will uh, put together the type of plan that we need to have to our calves and heifer reading program. So I will start talking about average daily gain, like everyone that knows me, I love average daily gain because I think in compass, uh, pretty much everything that we do on calf rearing, if we think on a calf and the way it's growing, I think it really puts together all these variables, right? Like if they are sick or not, if they, we are feeding them enough or not, uh, the genetics, the type of animals we have, the type of system we have, and especially having a target of average daily gain really goes through that idea of putting key variables that will encompass a lot of the data that in a lot of management uh, that we, we do in animals. And when we look in the average daily gain, I think it's very interesting how that relationship or that association that we have with production, with growth, with reproduction of these animals uh, in the throughout life. There is many uh, many papers here that I will not even go go through, but especially if we put targets of average daily gain and use that as our our roadmap to the technology that we use, I think it's fundamental for us to know, especially what will happen in the system that we have, especially with the early breeding and calving age, lower cooling rate, and more and more with the production level and have that other system. But the first thing that I want to say is that like when we put those targets in the technology or we put the target in the management that we do for these calves, can we actually do that? And I, I keep saying that like we all, I grew up is a, a harsh word, but we all have been now 20 years ago thinking on being at university, people would be, oh, our calves need to double their weight, are winning. Some farms would just increase the winning age to make sure that that happened. But actually research tell us that that 700 grams or one and a half pound per day, it's more or less a growth rate of our modern hosting cow that will achieve some of this, uh, some of this advantage that research have been seeing. The very simple account, I will uh, save some of time going through that. But that idea of we grow our calves at 1.5 pounds per day on the first 60 or the first 100 days, it's fundamental if we want to set up the system and just doing exactly that, discuss that why everything that we'll do and discuss on the technology, especially doing automatically, uh, there will be the roadmap that we'll put and we have put on our trials. 
and the first thing that I will say is like I work with a lot of farms and I I go to so many farms with average that are very different, right? This has nothing to do with the precision technology. I just keep saying and talking about that, especially whoever works with benchmarking farms, that the average can have very different distribution of weights or anything in, in particular, right? Could be a somatic cell count for farm, for cows in general in a herd. But if we think on average of calves, that grow or average daily gain for a group of calves. I prefer to talk about uh, animals that hit the target uh, average daily gain than the average in general, because the average can be like, we can see here very distant, different distribution with the same average of 28 here. Uh, and then we have farms that will have everyone, like the green farm here, that everyone would be around average, but then we have farms that would have a lot of calves much below average. So just because we keep talking about that target, I prefer to talk about calves that get to that target in general. But this leaving the side note, if we look at accelerated milk plans or feeding plans for calves in comparison to conventional, this is no rocket science. We did this a few years ago go through the Journal of Dairy Science, everyone that had compared more or less uh, than six liters of milk in that time, if it was more than six, we call accelerated for less than six liters per day per calf, uh, being that uh, standardized by, by milk nutrients, we found that obviously, if you feed more calves, uh, more milk to calves, they grow more, they grow faster. However, you can see that that doesn't mean anything, right? Some of the, the calves here that were even receiving high allowance of milk didn't get to the target. And if we look at some of these, actually one of is our, even our own paper that I'll talk a little bit here, uh, achieve it even on conventional, conventional feeding. But if that key of feeding calves more milk, and especially if we discuss that with automated feeder, we want to give more milk to calves, we want to make them grow faster. How technology can, can support that type of, uh, of management and what can we do, how we can set up these programs, how we can win these calves when we have that problem of feeding calves more milk, we need to make sure that we transition them through weaning in a successful way. And the calf is there, right? Like 41, 41 here, Fantastico is there thinking about like if they will replace the nutrients that depending the source that they have. The idea of feeding calves a restricted amount of milk obviously makes sense. We want them to transition early uh, to grain, wouldn't make sure that they would drink just, you know, would not be saciated with the amount of milk we, for, we give to them and then they would eat more solid feed. And we discussed that, we had a lot of ideas and I will just present this paper because it will be the basis of what I think we can do more and more that they'll, actually I will talk about automated feeders here, but a good chunk of our farms now are doing that, even uh, feeding calves by hand and we even do it, feeding calves with a milk taxi here at the university. And at that point we had that question, like what happened and especially can we move or change the feeding behavior of calves depending on the amount of milk we provide to them. And we went there, we fed calves, or, or better, we offer calves here six, uh, eight, 10 or 12 liters of milk, uh, increasing, in, increasing allowance. They would obviously not uh, drink most of it during the day. And here was a 24 hour program where at midnight the allowance would go back to zero. So they, they drink a little bit less than the allowance and that was was planned. But if we see at day uh, at six weeks of age, we reduce the allowance in 50%, a plan that is uh, known as a step down, very commonly used now uh, in the industry. And then three weeks later, we in this calves completely. And as expected, right? This is not rocket science, we offer more milk to calves, fastest growth we got on these calves, especially on that four to six weeks with this plan. If we look at the grain intake, the feeding, like the plan or the, 
the process, the animal science side, the nutrition side, that you put on the technology automatically will change how much grain they will eat. Obviously, the calves that were here on a somewhat restricted diet at six liters per day would eat more grain at week six. But as soon as we, we step these calves down, we have this X effect and we did a couple of trials now until 14 weeks. And if you standardize this by body weight, actually you see no difference of grain intake. But if you look at total uh, dry matter intake, the calves that were under 12 liters end up eating a higher amount on the 10 to 14 weeks of life. It's an X effect, right? This calf is not eating enough grain until week six, you reduce the amount of milk they offer automatically, obviously they are more motivated to eat more grain. And if we look through the data in, and I like to point out that even the calves here on the six liters per day was one of the papers that I mentioned before, they still grow above the target, one and a half pounds per day on that first uh, 60 days of life. But obviously we had increased uh, growth on during the whole period, more milk we gave, and especially found no difference on the total dry matter intake. But even if you look at the pulse winning data, the calves that were in the 12 liters end up, 10 and 12 liters end up eating more grain. And that is like not just us, right? Like we have seen the very same data in many of the papers where we find that like first four weeks of life, with those nutrition programs, we are able to put more weight on these calves and then becomes very similar throughout uh, the, the average daily gain throughout winning. And that's more or less that conundrum being solved, right? Like if we are able to do that, and that's what I mentioned that these both papers, mine and Mike's, uh, Mike Steele paper have been done with automated feeder, but many farms are doing exactly the same thing uh, using this data by hand. And if we look at the metabolized energy data, uh, you can see that what really happened is that those calves had greater intake of milk uh, early on, and then they are able to, during the, the transition of the weaning, they are able to eat it enough. However, if we start to think on these calves, on this double uh, of phase feeding, right? Like in two phases on milk and concentrate using the knowledge and using the technology to do it automatically. We can start like, even now we are discussing three phases, four phases, what happened to having uh, calves in different plants and especially what is that data looks like, right? Like in the question that I always ask, and especially to farms that feed calves manually, is like, do you know how much grain are your calves eating during weaning or week six, week seven, week 10, 12? Uh, what is going on? What is the average difference? And the technology comes to give some of this data and we can use that to set up our plans. So, but the history doesn't end there, right? Yes, like I don't need to come here and tell anybody that we can put plants and that's what milk feed plants to calves and that will change how their behavior change. We do this to cows, we do this to, to fresh cows, to dry cows. And like there is a very clear response between what an animal is allowed to what they will do and especially the other side variables, right? So if we increase pellets in the robot, obviously they will eat more and less of our PMR on the feed bank. The same thing here with calves. Uh, if we give them more allowance per day in milk or in time or minimum visit in the automated feeder, we will change their behavior. However, has some intrinsic difference between some of these calves. And they especially when we are talking about very young animals, right, neonates, uh, those individual differences end up being very broad and really influence how these animals will do in this very intensive system that we have them. So when we think about the cows, right, like we think about the heifer, the little calf that is there, we hope that this animal will become, well, if it's not a beef on dairy or an animal destined to be on the meat market, we hope that these animals will be on our farm and will uh, be dairy, very successful dairy cows or dairy animals in our system. And if we are talking about these animals, 
Can, can we actually manage them individually? Can we know what that in, individual will do? And can we select those individuals that are more uh, prone to succeed on our, on our system? So as our farm grows, our systems end up being more group resilient. I think that the technology gives us the possibility to actually talk about each of these animals and tailor uh, some of the management to, to the individual, right? Like I think we, and I, more I talk about that, more people make the same comment that we came full circle, right? Like we were in a place probably 50, uh, five, six, seven decades ago that the animals were raised individually. We went all the way that the animals are raised pretty much in hundreds or in thousands in group setup. And now with the technology, sometimes we have that possibility to go back to give the management to that animal, to tailor the management to that animal specifically, especially if we know some of those predictive variables that we think these animals will respond to. And I will talk about some of this concept right now, and especially what we are doing with some of, of this data. And going back to calves, I, we have some data on cows as well, but today I'm, I will just talk about calves. If we go back to some of this system now that we have the milk feeder, the grain feeder, the hay feeder, actually even the water feeder with uh, automated measurements of weight uh, and activity of these animals, we are able to pretty much uh, close that full circle and control the animals of, uh, control the lives of these animals from the computer. So the big challenge, right, if we think about calf feeding in general, is that we have shortened the milk feed period or the liquid diet period from five to eight months to six to ten weeks. And that transition obviously uh, presents a challenge to many of these animals, right? The calf is born, it has to learn where, how, and what to eat in weeks that before would take time. Most of the time without a social model, the cow is not there, the heifers are not there, it's an environment that it needs to navigate on its own. We, our calves do it generally successfully. And I just showed the line, the red line there, is the perfect line that I just talked about, right? Like the calves were there, they were offered 12 liters per day. They go through the red line, obviously they don't eat a lot of grain with starter intake for five or six weeks. Uh, one day these poor calves go to the, like they go to the feeder, the feeder just dispense half of the milk that they were used to, to six liters. They like, they obvious that increase their hungerness. They start to eat grain. If you look here at the day of weaning, if we look some of the, even the gold standard from the CHA, they suggest that calves should be eating a little bit over three pounds per day of grain at the day of weaning would be one and a half kilos. The red line is like very close to double of that. These calves would be uh, doing very well. But when we investigate it further, and each of the gray and black lines there are individual calves, that is a very different history, right? So Joao goes through, um, I, I will go through the world talking about the red line. But when we go through that line, you can see that a lot of these calves, obviously have like great calves here. Like, I don't know if my pointer can be seen, but like very high lines that even at day 45, 50 weeks before winning, they were much above the starter intake. And this is the great animal, right? Like they fall, they read uh, the NRC, they know what to do. They are very motivated to eat grain. But at the same time, we have these stupid calves here that are the, the nightmare of everyone that raised them, right? That, Literally, this calf is 10 days after being started weaning. They still not eating any grain. Milk is pretty much cut off by the time that they start to eat any of the dry matter intake that we hope for. And if we look even further of that data, the grain consumer that week of weaning with the final weight is a direct relationship. And here we, and I, I have standardized this 
by body weight and winning all that like nothing makes a that much of a difference because it's obvious right if these calves are eating well during winning they will not lose weight they will not have a growth check they will do well at 100 days of age and can we identify these animals can we go there and make sure that these these calves not the fairy joel here the calf that is doing really well but these calves that are doing very poorly the poor doers of our group can we identify and change uh the the history of these calves on our on our farm and we have done some actually very interesting work with uh, personality difference of these animals and we actually found that if we do some tests and we now with activity as well we are able to identify these calves very early on that the calves that are more explorative and more curious is in our intensive systems are the ones that are doing really well but can we do individualized programs for these animals and can we make sure that these poor doers actually do well on our system and we did some of these trials i'll talk about one of uh one here very classic idea right to calves should be win by feed intake we did that like more the calf ate grain faster it would be a wind automatically by the machine we made a system that if it ate an average of three days half a pound would lose 25 percent uh, a pound and a half would lose another 25 percent of the milk allowance and then when it ate three pounds these calves would be completely wind and that was the age difference of these calves that were in this automated system we had like really smart, well, smart, or at least food motivated calves that win themselves even prior to the age system here with 42 to 55 days. We had the average calves that did 55 to 7 is very normal and what was expected. And then these very late calves, including two calves that went to 90 days and were like, okay, buddy, now you need to leave. You cannot drink more milk. We need to win you. And that is a that is a major question, right? If we had this data and we do automatic winning of calves what to do with these calves and you know actually we have been finding out that these calves struggle in transition in general just not winning but can we predict these animals that will do well and especially uh start the intake is such a hard data to come by or to get to collect on farm uh, can we use some of the indirect measure to do that and the answer is yes actually we can get together i will uh go fast on this but we can get together data of these calves in general uh with activity feeding behavior the behavior that they show on the automated feeder to actually predict the age of weaning automatically of these animals so we didn't even need to wean them automatically right we could put age in the model as a posterior variable and use that data to predict when these calves should be win and they should do do much better and we are doing some of this try and hope to have some data soon but we are able to do that not just and that's what i wanted to to point out not just in this very fancy system with uh, all the data that we can get but we actually did all the way it's just it actually it's 2023 or just published looking that we can predict uh the solid feed intake of these calves even when they are well beef on dairy calves raised individually and fed manually twice per day so obviously the technology help and give us a lot more data but the system is very reliable throughout the system that we have and these individually uh feed intakes that we have why is there can we change the outcomes of this data can we change these calves can especially we found the sport doer and change them and if we look this data even more carefully there are many things that we have been known for decades right calves will do this peak of intake and then a valley 
uh, they will have well what we expect sara event during this time we have this discussion what is sara to calves but if we think that each time that a calf has one of these peak and valleys uh the continuation of that feed intake will be decreased we have a chance to change uh even the intake of this animal but even to predict when uh probiotics could be implemented intervention could be implemented and especially control some of this problem and that's what we are actually working on this uh right now with some some good success but the idea of having this data in general is get give us the possibility of a lot of automated use like so uh john john doe is there managing a thousand calves would be really hard for us to ask him or pretty much impossible to sit in front of the foster technique uh software and find every peak and valley like oh this calf increased acceleration of dry matter intake in four times it was expected that he would eat a kilo he ate three kilos uh, we need to go there and do something but what if the automated feeder could dispense the probiotic already expecting that problem to happen is i think what will be changed through time and we can incorporate so much of our knowledge uh into that system right to have these calves very inclined to to be the cows that will be on this out very complex systems of the future the same idea that we are doing to calves are doing to cows i think there are many obvious things with proprietary glycol with probiotics with uh, pellets uh or feed tables in general in the robots but the idea that we can change feeding behavior of these animals automatically it's fundamental for us to think some of these more complex system with the use of technology for the future and just to finish, there are many changes of management that we envision, that we talk, that we, I think technology comes to, to change the way we have our relationship with animals in our, uh, in our systems. And one of those that we've been talking again, uh, to use technology to change the way we deal with disease or we deal with illness in our systems, is that we keep talking about alert lists we keep talking about early detection of disease and i always have and I always been questioned by farmers as well being like okay great i wake up every day and i have 20 cows or 20 calves in my alert list what i do it then if if i go there and i check these animals they are healthier that day can should i go there and treat all of them doesn't matter what should I call my herdsman and do a SOP for these animals that are in the alert list? And I think there are many approaches to it and every farm has a different one. But for me at that time and more now, and actually I have to thank Dr. Cantor here, Melissa, my, one of my former PhD that just became a professor at Penn State, that we discuss a, for a long time if we are going to use all this data can we actually do something automatically to change the outcome and the severity of this disease or especially more than identify uh change how we manage disease on our calf barns and we did that at that point now five years ago we decided to collect all the data to identify the changes of behavior of these animals and go through this process of using BRD as a model to see what it changed in behavior to detect that disease very early, create early intervention, and then do on farm application. And during that period, we actually found out, and I will talk about how we can detect relapse as well. But the idea is that calves and animals in general, even us, right? COVID was a class example. When we are getting sick, we change the behaviors that we we perform throughout the day. Will calves decrease feed intake? They decrease uh, calf starter intake. They become a lot more restless. So they uh, in decrease line bouts. They will stay lying 
for much longer, they will decrease step count and they will increase line times, right? Like we do that. Everyone that deals with calves or manage calves knows that when they are getting sick, that's even how we identify some of these disease on our calf band, right? We go there, they are a lot more lethargic, they are not doing their normal behavior, they don't approach us. And the technology, of course, it's able uh, to detect some of these changes. So our plan at that time was like, okay, we know this changing orders have like shown that and we did as well in some of our papers. Can we actually create detection algorithms to detect BRD on farm using this data? And we went there, our calves had everything that my money could buy at the time. We had an uh, activity monitors, uh, microchip to detect temperature of these animals, obvious automated feeders and automated grain feeders. Uh, we also had the data from going to the, the calf barn and do health checks on all these animals, including uh, twice per week lung ultrasounds and weighing of these animals. And we are able to use all this data, I will not go through here uh, about all the nuances of the model, but to collect all these variables, I think in the end, 59 variables in general, to make an algorithm that would detect with very high, actually, uh, precision and accuracy if the animal was getting, uh, was getting sick, actually running out of time. But the idea is that we can use a lot of this data uh, to detect with some, especially when we get to that like three, four days prior to disease with very high uh, certainty. And one thing that is actually very interesting that we found is one of our papers is that if we look at the manual accuracy, so here the yellow uh, algorithm accuracy of just using manual data actually is less reliable than using automated variable. And that was highly related to the lack of, because this is a time series event with the lack of homogeneity day by day of human, uh, human uh, disease detection. So we are obvious animals change, we are able to detect, but great. We are going there and we detect these animals that are like, oh, it might be becoming sick what to do with that and as i mentioned many times i really think the technology should do things automatically so the list is really good right but i get a i get a report on my apple watch every day saying that i'm lazy and i don't do anything about that right like if it shocked me every time every day that i was like lazy i would probably run every day and that was the idea here so instead of send a list to the farmer at this point, our managing, our research center, to our manager saying like, oh, these four calves were in our algorithm, we thought what would be a very good nutritional intervention that would be very broad and probably would work. And for calves that colostrum, there is a lot of research uh, showing now, even a lot of our research showing how it is very supportive of animals at risk to become sick. And that's what we did. Like these calves that were it, uh, detected by the algorithm, they got three days of a colossal supplementation. Well, half of them, half of them got placebo. If we look at day zero, the data of the algorithm, detect these animals, obviously 100% of them were not considered sick at that point because every calf that was sick before the algorithm be detected was censored but then that all these animals the blue line got uh, the colostrum the red line or the pink line got the placebo so it was just milk replacer for three days and so the idea is that the feeder is there has a colostrum supplementation already installed to it and if the calf gets uh, in the list of becoming sick on the next field day would receive it obvious here was done by hand, but could be done automatically easily. And the chance is a survival curve. The chance of these calves getting sick was highly uh, significant. And we did this with, well, actually the University of Guelph in a project with us did that with diarrhea with the same, very similar results. So, more than create the early intervention, that idea of changing behavior, one of the things that we realized, actually, I will give all the credit to Melissa for that. One day she showed up and was, 
every calf that we treat for BRD. In the next five or six days, I can tell if they will relapse and have to be treated or if that treatment could be cured. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting thought. And we end up looking at this data and creating an algorithm that actually we are very, because it's the uh, data science dream to have a day zero. We know the day that this calf was sick because it was treated with BRD. And then the next few days, how it changed behavior, we actually would be able to show. Here I'm showing step counts, but there are many other changes that happen uh, in behavior in the next seven to 10 days. And especially if we think on the high rates of, release, of relapse for these animals that are treated for BRD, that was actually a very interesting activity index, step count, all of that are very change and affected. If 14 days later after that calf was treated, if it would be retreated or not in our, in our SOP. And so in summary, calves show those behaviors. I think we can detect, and I'm not saying that our algorithm should be commercial and detect now, but the approach that we should be changing the way that we, in my opinion, that we should deal with disease on the calf barn and even with cows, even with other animals in general, is that we should create early intervention that could be done automatically by our precision technology without, uh, or better, with little to less intervention of the human that are already too busy to deal with the data that is created. And I think early intervention has a crazy potential to ameliorate the disease severity in our systems. And there is a lot of on-farm application, right? We work with that, we are doing that, but I think the next step is actually some of this data is too hard to collect commercially, but more and more that technology will become available. And I think we can do some of this approach and especially this mindset to, to deal with management of calves uh, on data. And I think there are so many interventions that we can do, right? With electrolytes, like so many nutritional uh, additives that can be used. And more and more, I think even with selecting these animals to have a tailor management depending line. Individualized nutrition or especially uh, smart nutrition plans, right? This is what we're working now where instead of you have one feed table to every animal that are in that farm, like a feed table that actually learn the patterns of that animal and with that change some of the variables and make sure that that animal will perform at the desirable level is fundamental. And I think that is more and more that we can do to detect these animals that will do well in our intensive system. And just one point, just to talk about this individualized system and not just talk about calves. We are working a lot with heat stress and we did some very, very similar approach with automated uh, use of technology to change the management of animals using heat stress. So you, a long time ago, actually, uh, IMS company came to us and discussed that idea that most of our system to abate heat in a dairy system were gone. When we think about uh, uh, automated milk systems, and we started to discuss, could we make a system that was voluntary to use this, to get these cows, the heat abatement system that they need to, to be uh, producing well on our farms. And we created a very system, very, at that point, very rough system, like you can see here, right? Like rocket science with plywood four by eight and, and silver tape and zip ties. But now it's actually more beautiful little container that is going on. But the idea was that could we get the data from this cow? So the temperature, obviously the environmental temperature, how much they produce, their behavior and allow them to walk to this system and get soaked as many times per day as they wanted in this trial, but especially create automated system or smart automated system that would um, save water and still at the same time get these cows soaked uh, during the day. So we trained these animals to go there. They were very good at it. Actually, if you look, some of these cows went 
200 to 150 times per day when got Kentucky hot, as I like to say. I don't know if most of you haven't been in Kentucky, but Kentucky in August and, and September can get like, you know, THI of 80, what is really high. And some of these cows would spend 150, 200 cycles of five seconds per day uh, in this system. But could we put together an idea that which cows were, how hot they are, and especially what was our level of requirement for this heat abatement requirement for these animals in some of these systems? And there have more and more, right? Like there is uh, many other behaviors that we can. Uh, that we can use and do on the precision livestock farming for these animals. And I will uh, finish talk that just a reminder of what I talked today about the individualized nutrition program for calves and cows. I think it's coming and is an option and more and more we should be doing. I think we as managers should be, be using data to provide support management decision, but the technology have a lot of potential to do the simpler things automatically that we could already put our knowledge into the system. And that is absurd amount of automatization for our dairy system. So I would like to thank all the sponsors of my research lab, say that I'm, well, for now, employed by University of Kentucky, and I will be here to answer any question that anyone may have. Sorry that I passed for two minutes. Oh, you're, all, you're good. Thank you, João. The presentation was awesome, and I know we have some questions on the Q&A, but before we jump in that, I just want to remind everyone that you can still keep sending uh, questions if you have, and you didn't have a chance to add this to the Q&A box. And before I pass it over to Margaret, Osdorf, who is going to be taking care of the Q&A today. I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, we'll be having these Technology Tuesday sessions until the end of February. And next week, January 24th, we are going to have Tim Terry from Pro Dairy talking about to retrofit or not to retrofit and strategies to build better barns. So stay tuned and we hope to see you next week. So with that, Margaret, if we, you can help me with the Q&A and thank you very much, John. Yes, thank you so much. And we look forward to those future programs. So uh, Dr. Costa, we have a few questions in the chat and I'll try and group them for you by topic. But we have a few questions to start off asking about some of the research that you did. And they want to know uh, what system did you use to track the lying bouts and the activity level of the calves? So, well, I will talk about that specific trial, but just in general as well. On that specific trial, we actually use ice robotics, so the ice cube uh, system. But we have been working with the NIDAP system as well. Actually, it's a cow uh, monitoring, but it works for calves. And now, I think commercially we have two others. That is the Foster Technique uh, system, and we have uh, oh my God, I should know. Oh, the SCR system as well. So, but it's a, a electronic ear tag. But in that trial specifically, we use Ice Cube Ice Robotics. Great, thank you. And then um, what was the milk allowance during the study that you showed where calves were weaned based on individual intake? And a second part to that, do you have any suggestions on what the max milk allowance should be for calves so that they are encouraged to eat starter? And what day of age should calves hit that max? That's perfect, yeah. Well, <laughs> I have a, an hour long talk about it in general, and I think people can find not to, uh, not to, well, it's not very difficult to find it online, but I think the in that trial specifically, and we've been working quite consistently with, if we do standardized whole milk with around 10 liters of allowance for the first four or five weeks, and then the automated, well, the automated winning or other winning strategies from there on. And why that, right? Like that is very close to what calves will eat without uh, a lot of waste 
uh, of milk. And if we start to think on feeding calves on that two phases, is that we are giving the calf the first four weeks to drink as much milk and grow as much as it can, and then think on the next two, four weeks as that transition, right? Making sure that they eat solid feed as much as they can. Um, and that's what we did, like 10 liters, 35 days, and then obviously automated, automated winning strategies. That's what we do actually even by hand as well. That's what I recommend in most of our farms. We do 25, uh, 28 to 35 days of full allowance and then reduce that, that constantly. Uh, the second question was that, uh, do you have any suggestions on what the max milk allowance should be? Yes, well, and is I think like, and there is a target here, right? That we forget sometimes. And I get that question all the time. What is the perfect milk allowance I should put on my feeder? Or even like, what is the milk feeding plan that I should do on my farm? And I always ask the opposite question, right? That is like, what is your target for the calf raising age? So do you want your calves to grow how much for a hundred days? How much you want it to cost? How, what is your interest? Like what is the forage quality that you're going to provide these animals during winning? What do you have, you know, X, Y, and Z. There is so many variables here, especially what is your disease prevalence or disease challenge that you have on your calf barn? And that will change some of these targets, especially what is your milk replacer? Is it whole milk? Are you able to pasteurize? Is it cheap or not? But, you know, beyond the classic nutrition question that we have, I think we should think the, on the calf raising strategy with and without technology that that first month, doesn't matter what we do, calves will not eat solid feed enough. So milk is fundamental. And I like to work on that 10 liters average or 10, 10 liter milk, whole milk equivalent because gives the calves a pre, or most of the calves, pretty close to at libdom feeding for that four weeks and give us four weeks to work that calf from a very high allowance of milk to solid feed, whatever solid feed in that point uh, is. Um, and then, yeah, like if at least three weeks of gradual weaning, if you are doing any high allowance like that, that's what the big rule of thumbs. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple questions that are focusing kind of more on the management side of things. So after treating a sick calf, sometimes their milk intake still stays low. What is the best option to increase appetite to maintain average daily gain? <laughs> well, if I knew that, I, I joke like many times that I would be drinking whiskey in Bahamas, right? Because those are like uh, big questions. But the idea is that Obvious, this calf should not be on a competitive environment. So one thing that we try to do, thinking on the technology, right, is to remove any barrier that the calf may have to assess milk, especially because normally it's associated with an automated feeder. So uh, actually even, I will not talk about the brands, but some of the brands have these like, you can go there and say that the calf is treated and it will pretty much give a free for all for that calf for the next week or so to make sure that it will assess milk as much as you want. More and more, and this is like, I'm not a veterinarian, but more and more working with the veterinarian supportative therapy is working really well and we are integrating that on our protocols. So if as any, well, work with your veterinarian to create your own, but any SADs and other, uh, even oral supplements are working really well. And the, I think the most important is to keep an eye on these animals, right? Like we have, like that is the paper there talking about relapse uh, recognition, but more important is like, it's hard to say to people keep track of the data, but at least those animals that have been treated, if you're not seeing, improvement on some of more activity, more feed intake, more uptight, uh, more visit to the feeder, that is a pretty bad indication that that calf is not recovering, right? That you have a relapse. So I think those three things are fundamental, especially keeping track of this, the time series of that animal. 
I agree. Can can be tricky, but you have to keep an eye on them for sure. Um, we have a question. Is there is there any reliable technology to track calf health that is not associated with the automatic milk feeder? So there is a lot of development on that. Uh, and I will talk about you know the real side and then the, the Jimmy Rig side that people are doing on far. So yes, there are. So if we think about even the technology, the, the activity sensors, they work without the automated feed and they give pretty good indication uh, of what is going on. More and more, we have technology coming out on the market, uh, discussing that some of them, even with skin temperature and activity and with that, they try to combine, obviously, Feeding behavior is the holy grail right now. If you look at the research, we just did a review on uh, the use of technology on calves, and I think 80% have been done with automated feeder. So it still dominates. But now if we think on the gym rig side, and especially in Brazil where uh, we have babesiosis as a major disease that comes from uh, the ticks, right? Like that comes from is a parasite that actually is very uh, very severe. A lot of farms that I know are working with automated collars and activity monitors for that disease, and they detect BRD as well, obviously, in some of the older calves. However, that requires a lot more time, right? The algorithm of the technology are not ready for that, so you need to look at the data you use as a secondary measure. I think that in the future, you know, I when people ask me, well, a few years ago when we started to work with precision technology in calves, what was one of our major objective? And one of my major objective was to create light or interest on work on calf data. And I think that is being created not just by me, but but the system in general. And I think we will see a lot of that coming soon. There is a lot of development out there, a lot of validation, and a lot of this technology actually work really well with calves. Great. And um, does the calf, does the log and the data associated with the calf, does that, is that able to stay with them after weaning? Is there a way to save that? Yes. And the, so yes, like most of the technology actually keep track. Some of the brands do not keep log, so the, the data is lost but some of them are and the technology that we've been using uh, are however the calf feeder and the anything else right that we think on the adult side on the cow side they do not connect right so at this point in time even as we are doing some long-term work we have to merge that data like you know none of the cow that i know of maybe i'm saying something wrong here and someone will send me an email in 10 minutes but as i know of none of the calf technology right now are able to be imported on pc dart or 305 dairy comp 305 or something like that that we could keep that data okay um we have a few questions that are focused more around the financials so maybe you can help speak to some of this. Um, um, hold on one second. Another question. Is there any economic evaluation of the cost benefit of adopting these technologies for farmers that you know of? So we're, well, we are working on the early detection of disease economics and that uh, I, will, I will not comment on it. We don't have that data yet. I think that it will be, we will have a really good ROI in the sense that how much calves are being affected by disease and that's why we have so much interest. However, with the use of automated feeders and especially collecting this data and having the ability to, because you know most of the surveys have already shown that the, the labor usage of a system that is based on an automated feeder 
and hand feeding is very similar, right? Like there is less labor, but more qualified labor and the economics of it end up being very similar. What happens is the possibility that it gives and normally it pays off when we have high milk allowance. So the idea is that if you are interested on in having calves grow faster and have a very high feed milking program, the automated feeder will pay itself and it will be a better economical decision if your plan is to feed four or five liters of milk and have a, let's say, a less intensive raising system for calves normally is equal or the, the automated feeder is not, economic, is not an economical uh, decision. And together with automated feeder, you have a change of management, right? Like you need to have, it's not just now your cows being fed by automated feeder, you are changing your whole approach to calf rearing with management, with the type of people that will be there, the, uh, the disease detection, and that has to be taught in account. We have actually a very interesting publication from I think the sur well, I think no, I know the surname is Hawkins uh, of the first autos. And looking at that, we actually did the uh, so four milk allowance, whole milk, pasteurized whole milk, and milk replacer. And we did individual automated feeder or mob feeder in the system and compared the 12 of them. And actually, it's very interesting because the difference per calf end up being. 10, $15 if we think on the viability of that system. So end up, in my opinion, at least one of the big conclusion of looking at some of these financials is that what is the farm wanting for that calf raising program is more important than the economics behind it, especially when you put in perspective how much like the enterprise of the dairy farm costs. And and together with that, actually, one thing that I think is changing slowly is that how many animals you are going to have on that system and how much data, how much, in, you know, just how much complex you want that system to be. And that, I think, is a, a big factor that is influencing calf raising programs, not just economics. Do you think that this type of technology can be implemented on smaller farms, oh. 200 cows or less? Is that a, a good profitable choice? To be honest, it's more like nowadays, <laughs> we are pretty much making systems to the big farm. That system is made for the smaller farm. So if we think, well, US a little bit different, but if we think of like even the Western world, most of the automated feeder, most of the technology being directed to calves are on a smaller farm, normally robotic farms that also have an automated feeder for many reasons, right? Like labor constraints and all of that. So the system is pretty much ready <laughs> to the smaller farms in the calf side. I think that's where, especially people that don't have a lot, you know, you, you lose that mandatory times with your calves that you need to be there at six to seven, four to five when you have the automated feeder and a lot of the small farms are looking for that. And nowadays, most of the adaptation is actually to be able to have 500, 600, 800 calves on the automated system, uh, the automated milk system. And so the technology, different than cows, right? When we talk about, well, cows as well, like, I don't know, that is that a major discussion of being bimodal. Smaller farms use a lot of technology and then some of the bigger guys, but technology is just a tool, right? Like the system that you implement on the farm, it's what will pretty much bring the need of technology or not. And the size of the farm is obviously a factor, but normally is a less influential factor than the type of system you want to have or fits on the farm itself. Great. We have a few questions going back to some management topics. Um, recognizing that technology combined with management can improve calf survival, what should our target for death loss in pre wean calves be on US commercial dairy farms? Zero. No calves should die. <laughs> well, but, um, well, the target should be zero, right? Like we, I joke with some of our benchmark 
uh, the farms that we work with benchmarking and extension in general, that the best system is that calves don't die. Obviously, we have the parturition mortality that normally we cannot uh, influence as much, but as soon as the calf it's dry, heat, our system should be it should be a heifer that leaves that that system pre-wind. Most good now talking about population uh, quartiles in general. I like to if you see the seventy five percent best farms in most of the the surveys are on that two and a half three percent mortality. So one and you know if you're better than that, that is a a good a good point to be right now. The, the greatest point is zero, but that I think is a, a good system. And, and I would say that like survival shouldn't be used, you know what I mean? Like I have this great quote uh, that we keep saying, we hear for many years, that it's like, it's a terrible benchmarking that we are, how many calves are we keeping alive, right? Like I think there are better variables that should be used. I talked today about average daily gain, but treatment rate, especially nowadays with lung consolidation, how many diarrhea bouts you have for 100 calves or age of diarrhea, things like that, I think works very well. And more and more, and even on that paper that I just mentioned, I think the economics of calf raising should be around uh, feed efficiency, right? Like if we think on a thousand pounds of protein that we are putting on that system, how many pounds of calves or body weight we are putting on those animals. And those metrics, I think, really inform how well we are doing raising calves. I think that's a great point, because if you focus on those those things, then your yeah. death loss is going to be decreased, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> after that. Um, what's your opinion on multiple colostrum feedings? Can this be a manner of early intervention to reduce morbidity and mortality? Uh, yes, really. So now I'll give a, a small background because we are doing a lot of research on both ways with colostrum. One is using it as a supportive therapy to calves that are with diarrhea or BRD, but also, and that is more on a collaborative, I keep following that research, that is to feed a transition diet, let's say, instead of having a two-feeding, pro a two-phase program, have a three-phase program, right? Like, a uh, colostrum or a supportive treatment the first one or two weeks of life, then full allowance, then weaning. Uh, and both of those research branches are having a lot of success. They, I think, like would be, uh, especially, and at this point in time, if especially if we think economically, uh, if we are able, to have maternal colostrum that you have on the farm works really well because colostrum replacer, there is a, a cost to it. But even with colostrum replacer, especially in places that are challenged, I think the implementation of that like 10, well, I will not give a number, but low amounts of IgG for very long, especially in the first two weeks of life works really well. And there is a lot of research supporting it. For the treatment side or the supportive therapy side, we have been working with, especially my group, our group have been working with a higher dosage for few days. So we have been dividing a bag of colostrum replacer uh, in three, four days for these calves that are presenting symptoms in our research with obviously very good results. I know we are doing a, a couple of trials right now with 30 grams of IgG per day on that supportive therapy. So if we think on a bag with 150 grams of IgG, that will be a five, you know, like three days, you would pretty much be able to feed two calves with one bag. That would be uh, our, our system. We need a lot more research, it's a classic ratio, right? Every professor says the same. We need a lot more research to do this and to have a recommendation, but in this point, we really need, but it's, and a lot of farms like this, you know, the creativity of dairy farmers is something that I'm always so amazed by. And more I talk about this, more I see farms doing a lot of things, freezing colostrum in 50 grams ice cubes, 
uh, you know, like going there and put second second milking uh, milk on the first week of every calf. More and more 50-50. So 50% colostrum, 50% milk for two or three days. You see all things on farm and I will not say that they all work, but I'm sure they are all going to the right direction. Yeah, it's really interesting and we look forward to hearing yeah. some of those results as you as you study it more. Um, what's the suit what is the suitable THI for dairy calves housing? So that's a very good question, and I will refer straight to uh, Dr. Van Oss from Wisconsin. She just published a paper discussing some of it for calves. And this comfort zone that I would say, like that we should put our calf bands, would be on that 58 to 64 uh, of THI. I think that will be a very good system. And obviously, it could rise to up to 68. 67 68 uh with acute rise right not keeping at that that height without changes of behavior it's really poor right our way to measure how how high or what is it suitable thi for calves and cows to cows is like they stop to eat right they are producing less milk to calves is like they started to paint they are uh more like they are lying much longer and I think when we get to those, like to that point, that means that the animal has been stressed already, right? So we could keep it like for sure lower than that. So if we think that we start to see some of these patterns at 68, 70, for sure would be safe. If we, and I coming back to Dr. Van Ostra uh, experiment at like that 60 to 65 range as a maximum THI to calves with you know obviously and here especially being in kentucky for that long i know how hard it is right our thi china we are going to publish now our thi inside of our um, uh, calf barn had days of 78 79 especially when we had no wind even having uh mechanical ventilation in our system so it's hard to do is investment but I think that is very good outcome, especially in, in areas that are super affected by heat stress. And going back to Florida's, well, now Jimena is in, in Wisconsin as well, but that body of research showing us how important protecting calves and dry cows from heat stress are, I think is something that would pay itself. I agree. And that's all we have for questions. We have many thanks, many thank yous in the comment section for this wonderful program and presentation that you gave us. So thank you again so much.